I love the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. So I just pray right now, and I hope you'll agree with me, God, however you want to bless that spirit of prophecy to unfold, the testimony of your healing virtue flowing into Anne's body and restoring her health. However you want to bless us with that, we just, we're open. We, we welcome it the healing virtue of Jesus Christ to flow into our bodies, and not only our bodies, our spirits and souls, in Jesus' name. Good things are happening in our fast. If you didn't know, this is the seventh day of a 21-day fast that we're undertaking corporately, and some of you may or may not be fasting. (laughs) That's between you and Jesus. Jesus. But can I just tell you, if you're part of this body, you're going to be blessed from whatever's sown by the rest of the body, sowing into fasting and seeking the Lord. Just because you fast doesn't mean you're seeking the Lord, and just because you don't fast doesn't mean you're not seeking the Lord. And so, blessed are, the, are those that are in his house, that are in him, and put their delight in him. Uh, for the sake of this fast and uh, the, opera, the definition I'm operating from um, for a fast, it's defined as voluntarily abstaining from food for a period of time for the purpose of drawing near to God. That's my definition. I think it's a good one if you didn't know that already. Um, but that's, that's Emmanuel right there. Emmanuel, Hebrew for with us, God. He draws near to us, and we draw near to him. What a great motivation with a fast, even without a fast. Seeking God's presence, getting closer to him. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Today, I'm going to start a two-part message about four rewards that we receive with a biblical fast. Jesus says, when you fast, do it in secret. He says the same thing a little bit earlier in chapter 6 of Matthew. When you pray, pray in secret. And your Father who sees in secret, praying and fasting, will reward you openly. There's a wonderful promise of his reward. There's a cliche saying in, in Christianese, growing up in the church, people used to say, seek the giver, not the gift. We do. It's the essence of his word. Draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. We love him because he first loved us. But as we seek the giver, as we seek our Lord, as we press in, rewards flow. They come down upon us. His mercies rain down upon us. I'm going to go from Isaiah chapter 58 There are a number of texts in Scripture that talk about fasting. This, by almost unanimous opinion, is the most comprehensive text on fasting. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 and following. And there are more rewards than I'm going to go over in this mini-series, but I'm going to do what the Holy Spirit is leading me to do as I pour over His Word and give you the four that I have that He's given me to share But feel free to read the text on your own and see what God speaks to you. He always, the word is so, so deep. Can I get an amen for that? It is deep. Psalm 42, verse 7, David says, My deep, referring to God, calls unto your deep. It's the depth of God connecting with the depths of our hearts. His word is living. It is his word. And so there's always more and more greater things to discover in it. And with that, I'm just going to give us a little preface to Isaiah 58. Verse 15 of Isaiah 57. Isaiah is prophesying on behalf of God. He says, Thus says God, the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Amen. I dwell in the high and holy place, with him who has a contrite and humble heart to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Fasting is designed as a method for us to humble ourselves. 
And we can, as declared in Scripture, expect his grace to be poured out on us when we humble ourselves. He resists the proud, but he pours out grace, his divine favor, if you will, his enabling power, if you will, supernatural wherewithal that does not come from anywhere else but God. As we humble ourselves before him, he pours out grace. We all need grace. Grace to you and peace to you, saints of God. That is the preface to Isaiah 58, or at least in a verse. But what we find in Isaiah 58 is the prophet talking to a group of people that are 200 years in the future, give or take a few years. He's speaking to the people that will come out of a captivity that has not yet happened. We refer to it as the captivity in Babylon or, in theological circles, the exile of the children of Israel. Because they have sinned against God, they have been proud, and he is resisting them, and he is chastening those he loves. You don't have to say this exuberantly, but I mean it exuberantly. God chastens those he loves. Thank you, Lord, for the chastening, because it shows you love me. He's speaking to this group of people that have had a pattern for 70 years in exile of fasting the fifth and seventh months of every year. That's 140 fasts through a 70-year period, and they're getting their fast wrong. They are proud of heart, and God is trying to chasten them ahead of time. You see, post-exilic people of Israel... I mentioned to this to the prophet two centuries before so that you would understand that I am after humility. I want to be with you, and you want to be with me, but there's some things that need to be shaken off. There's some pride that needs to be laid down. They're stuck in their ways. So in verse 1 of Isaiah 58, God tells Isaiah, Cry aloud! Spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, they want to be with me, and they delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of of justice, they take delight in approaching me. They're seeking God. They want to be with him. And they think they're following the ordinances of God. But they're forgetting that God is after a contrite and humble heart. Even in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus tells us there's two commandments which reflect the uttermost of of, of humility. Love the Lord my God with all my heart, not myself. I'm laying myself down as I should properly for my God. I'm putting him first, humility. And the second commandment, just like it, love my neighbor as myself, esteeming others better than myself, as the Apostle Paul puts it. In the Old Testament, we find it in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the same idea, God is after a heart. Not after a ritual of fasting, after a relationship that we can only enter in as we receive his love, and as we love him back. It takes a lot of humility. I can't conjure up that humility. I can't make myself humble. But when I seek him, and I'm in his presence, he has a way of graciously humbling me, (laughs) repeatedly. This is a picture of a little guy that doesn't like fasting. The day may come when I decide to fast my breakfast, but not today. This is a little guy that might be suffering from the, relation, or the r- ritual of fasting. I decided to fast my breakfast. He's not eating anything. And I feel it. You, many people that have been here a while know what I, what I often say in these fasts. If you're not feeling it, you're not fasting it. 
if we're fasting in humility, we're going to feel it physically. We're going to feel it. There's going to be some times where we're not as nice as we should be. (laughs) But if we get stuck in the ritual, if we get stuck in the agenda of fasting, if we lose track of the heart of God in the fast to connect with us, it's a big deal when God wants to be with us. If we lose track of that focus, then we're missing the mark. We might as well not fast. I'll just keep eating my breakfast before fast Sunday. <laughs> like that little guy. This is the agenda that the people that Isaiah is prophesying to have. They, they question, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate. They're going through all the motions, yet they're not laying down their agendas. Josh Committer paraphrase. They strike the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. The message version says your prayers won't get off the ground with a proud fast, without laying down the agenda, without humbling myself before God, without surrendering and yielding to him. Is this a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul, to go through the ritual of fasting. The torture, really, because you're not getting anything from God if we keep our pride, right? We've got to humble ourselves. So that is the backdrop to this, these two rewards I'm going to mention today. The first one is freedom. Say freedom. Freedom. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. That is a huge, huge deal. It changes everything. I no longer live for myself. I no longer want to. I no longer crave bad things. I no longer want them. I no longer pursue them. I am free from my original sin. I am free from the prison of any kind of other sin that wants to hold me down. There was a woman about seven months ago that came to this church one afternoon, one of those unannounced appointments. And I'm not encouraging those because sometimes I can't take them. But, I will work with the Holy Spirit as he leads me. She came to visit, and she, I, she was very stiff in her neck. She felt pain in her back. And I could tell she was pretty distraught. And I'm slow in the uptake. I humbled myself before the Lord. I'm learning to do this all the time. She came asking me to pray for physical healing. She knows that sometimes God works through me in that area. But I'm humble, I'm humbling, thank you, Lord. I'm learning to ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to pray for in these situations, not just automatically assume. Holy Spirit, how do you want to minister to this this woman? I got the word anxiety. And so I asked her, "Are, are are you suffering from some anxiety right now? And she goes, yes. I said, I... I believe the Lord revealed that to me because he wants to relieve that and then relieve your symptoms. And I prophesied that. Would you let me pray for you? Of course, that's why I came. I led her through a prayer that many of us have learned, a similar prayer. Holy Spirit, would you reveal to me the lie that I've been believing that has been causing me to be anxious? And would you reveal to me the truth about who you are and that I can put my trust in you? She made an exchange of that lie for the truth. A metanoia. It's what we refer to as change of mind or repentance. She repented and immediately her symptoms left. She felt lighter. She came in heavy. She really did. It's so wonderful to see what Ann demonstrated today, the joy of the Lord when God touches not only your physical body but your heart. Amen. This woman was elated with the freedom of God. 
Some of us do not receive a healing, but we know God wants to heal. I'm just going to say to you, I'm going to go right straight to it. That is above my pay grade as to why. I know that God wants to heal, and he's able to heal. And he says in his scriptures, he heals all our diseases, Psalm 103. By his stripes we are healed, Psalm 53. Jesus healed all who came to him. And Jesus says, I'm willing, Matthew 8, 1 through 4. But sometimes it doesn't happen. I want to posit this idea in us, and I believe we have this already. This is a group that is, is, is pursuing the Lord. We know that he chastens sons and daughters that he loves. There may be some chastening going on. I don't know that for sure, but there may be some chastening going on. None of us are perfect, and it's absurd to think that we are. But the perfect one, the holy one, ministers to our hearts, and he chastens that which is not of him. He goes after it. He exposes it so that we can step into the sonship, the daughtership that he's, des that he's designed us to be in, that our identity can be fully in him. There's plenty of examples of people that received their soul healing and then afterward received their physical healing. Let it be an encouragement to you, brothers and sisters, that God is with us even in the midst of our sorrow. Verse 6 of Isaiah 58 says this. Isaiah is now moving into what is the proper type of fast. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? But one. Matthew 11, verse 29 and following. Come unto me, all you la who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. We're going to be yoked under something. Romans 6 and elsewhere, it tells us whatever, however we're living life, we're yoked under something, we're serving something. Jesus says it's so much easier if you serve me. The yoke he's talking about in the Old Testament and the New Testament that must be broken is not the yoke of Jesus. That's the yoke we need to have on. But the yoke that must be broken is the burden and heaviness of sin, of hidden sin, whether it's ignorant or outward sin, intentional, iniquity, as we would call it, transgression, premeditated sin. Every single one of us have done it, and probably most of us after being a Christian. Those yokes and the bondages that result in the sin is what he's trying to break. Amen. Jesus said this, most assuredly I say to you, he's talking to a group of Jewish believers in, Matthew, in John chapter 8, in verse 34, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. In the last couple of months, I have had a unique experience of talking with several people that have been betrayed in marriage in relationships in business inside the church i don't know how these things happen it just has been a run of them i do know partially why i see in part and i know in part this place is a hospital and we're called to minister to those that are hurting. I talked to a couple that they had a very close friend in ministry for a number of years. And this close friend, without them knowing, stole money from their ministry, used it for his own purposes, and then accused this couple of misappropriation of funds. It wasn't so much the accusation of embezzlement that got them. It was that they were so close to this person. It hurt them to the core. 
I happened to come across them. And there was a heaviness about them. These are believers, and they've done amazing things in the kingdom of God. Loved countless people. Many people have come to know the Lord through them. But they're heavy of heart because of this betrayal. And the Holy Spirit just guided me with this passage. I talked to him, I said, do you know that you're a son? Do you know that you're a daughter? Do you know that as a son and as a daughter, you have authority in Jesus over anything that would come up against you? He's the one that enables you to guard your heart and enables you to keep your peace no matter what the circumstance is. Do you see that you've become a slave? You've submitted the authority that Jesus has given you to the authority of this person and the treachery and the betrayal that they're acting in. You've taken your sonship and your daughtership and you've traded it in, your identity as a child of God, and you've traded it in to come under this. I told them, in fact, what you've done in the spirit of gentleness and love. In fact, what you've done is you've built up walls, a prison of unforgiveness that only you and the authority of Jesus can take down. Tears. Holy tears. There's times that the flesh and blood cannot reveal anything. God in heaven reveals those things. This is one of those times for me, just revealing this idea. Brothers and sisters, when we fast and we're drawing near to Emmanuel in this season, we're drawing near to who God, who's destined us to be free. We may want financial freedom. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> We, we may want some freedom in, in the natural, in some of the laws of the land. That's not a bad thing. But the freedom that's most important, that's preeminent in all our lives, is the freedom that Jesus Christ gives to our hearts. He sets us free and free indeed, so that no matter what happens in our relationships, no matter what happens in this land, no matter what happens around us, we remain free. I want to invite you to say this prayer with me. If you can't say it, this is a serious prayer. If it's hard for you to say, just take a picture of it or write the office. We'll make it available to you. Deanna can get it to you. And you can pray it later. Repeat after me if you're able. Heavenly Father, I reject the slavery. Just read it with me. Of trying to do things my way. The lie. I trade the heavy burden that I have been carrying for the freedom of being your son, daughter, the truth. Holy Spirit, I welcome your conviction and your love into my heart. I repent of any and every way that I have been an oppressor to others and have acted, acted to enslave others to my will. I invite you to reveal to me all the ways that you would have me humble myself and make restitution to those I have hurt, harmed, and sinned against. May I be a true son, daughter of my Father in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Raise your hand if you feel good about that prayer. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> I feel good about that prayer. I wrote that prayer, so that was just a little endorsement for me. No, that's not at all what I'm saying. It's Jesus. When we make that prayer and that declaration of truth, that's a humble prayer right there. I'm laying down my right to control this other person. I'm laying down my right to control my life. And I'm yielding to God, and he's enabling me to self-control. There are so many messages that I could go into from that point, but I'm not going to. 
Reward number one. Remember, rewards happen when we draw near to God, and Jesus promised rewards when we pray in the secret place. Reward number one is freedom. Reward number two is healing. I want to share a testimony with the house. One of many. Our sister, Ultra Covey, Ultra Strickland, used to be Covey. A few weeks ago, we started praying for her because she was on the brink of death. Her condition got worse. The doctors told Joseph, her husband, you need to prepare for the worst. We need to stop the machines. Cookie, her mother, last week told me, (laughs) she is doing better. All of her numbers are coming into line. She is communicating, and there's expectation that she will have a full recovery in the name of Jesus. (laughs) The doctors in China can't explain it. (laughs) I'm going to just share this for free. Jerome Groupman wrote a book about 10 years ago or more, a little over 10 years ago. Can't remember exactly. Doesn't matter. It's called How Doctors Think, and in it, he's a Harvard-trained physician who educates and trains other doctors. In this book, How Doctors Think, he describes a majority of doctors, some three-quarters of them, having witnessed a miracle. They don't all come to faith, but they do generally come to an encounter with some situation that they cannot explain. Science doesn't explain it, but our God does. He is Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. Amen? Amen. Woo! (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. How did we get on healing again? Oh, it's part of the message. (laughs) Then your light will break forth like the dawn. If you fast with humility, your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear, then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Now you heard me just say a little bit of Hebrew, what little I know, Yahweh Rapha. Rapha is the word in the Old Testament that is generally linked to physical healing. This word here is not Rapha, it's the Hebrew word arukah which is interpreted as healing, but it literally means putting a bandage around and making whole, bringing to restoration. It's only used six times in the Old Testament, and all six of those times surround this post-exilic period. Nehemiah uses it once. It's only only five times. Jeremiah uses it three times, and Isaiah uses it once. When Isaiah is giving this prophecy, he's prophesying to a group of people, the children of Israel, who are a covenanted people with God and who he knows are wounded and he wants to restore. I read through several commentaries on this in my presupposition that God wants to heal through this text. But in my yielding to what the Lord says in his text, I cannot go there completely. I cannot rule out that this can also apply for physical healing. I believe it does. But it most certainly means that God is wanting to restore a people and symbolically heal their wounds that they've picked up on. I want to just confess to you And by confession, I mean declare to you. This pulpit is set aside for people who put the word of God in a high place. They don't read their own theology and their own expectations into the word. They let the living word of God that divides, that is living and powerful, that separates between soul and spirit, people Speaking from this pulpit, that's what they do. And so I, I, just, I just feel that's important to lay, lay out there for our house. 
we get in trouble in charismatic circles. We're preaching healing. We're preaching prophecy. All in the word of God. Absolutely. But sometimes if we take it upon ourselves to say, let this be so and let that be so and declare these things and we haven't counseled or consorted with the word of God, aren't functioning from the revealed word of God, the scripture, we can find ourselves in a place that needs repentance because we're in the flesh, not the spirit. I'm getting a lot of nods so I can stop. I could go on with that, but I'll get, I'm going to go on. Message received, Becky says. Amen. We're going to move on. It is difficult to find a text in Scripture that links fasting with healing. David fasts in 2 Samuel 12 on behalf of his newborn child that is conceived because of adultery. And that child dies despite his fasting. David writes in Psalm 35, I fast on behalf of my enemies, yet they continue to come after me. I fast that they would be healed, verse 13 of Psalm 35. There's no evidence in that scripture that they received a physical healing. This is the closest scripture that I can come to, but it has a caveat. Jesus is coming down off the mountain. He's just been transfigured. We find the account also in Matthew 17 and in Luke He's come down the mountain and he comes to this setting where a bunch of disciples are unable to heal this epileptic boy. He's afflicted by a spirit. He's demonized. It throws him down. He foams at the mouth and he's suffering. His disciples are unable to heal it. And Mark 9, 29 says this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. The caveat is this is the only version of the Bible that that word fasting is found in Mark 9, 29. I want to give you, I feel led by the Lord to go deeper and deeper into his word and the truths of his word because of the season that we're in. There are a lot of voices that are contending for his children's ears. We need to be grounded in the word and in the truth of his word. The truth is, that this word fasting is only found in the New King James and the King James Version as handed down by something called the Textus Receptus. It's Latin for the received text. Greek manuscripts that Erasmus and some others translated into English in the late 16th and early 17th centuries and became the King James Version of the Bible. In later centuries, scholars and archaeologists found much more evidence in older manuscripts that didn't have the human error of translation interfering with what's now what we read in English. This is a variance. It's called a textual variance. And you will encounter people that will say your word is no good. The Bible is no good because of this. Examples like this and a few others. Which I don't want to go into, but maybe we'll go into it another time. They will say the Bible is false because of this human error. Yes, it is a human error. But theologians and scholars, people called lexicographers, those that write lexicons and know the Hebrew in and out and teach it and speak it, and the Greek in and out and teach it and speak it, they will tell you that of the whole of the Bible, there's only 1% to 2% of it that has any human error in it. And in fact, the passages that we see, there's a variance. There's many other passages that support the theme, what the heart of God in those passages that are variant. You understanding what I'm saying? Okay. So this, in my my opinion does not read fasting. It was something that was read in in the context of time, the word fasting, in the time, late 16th, early 17th century, when a lot of people were fasting. It is good to fast, but the truth of this scripture is the boy got healed through the prayer of Jesus, and it probably doesn't say fasting, even though the King James says that. If you're a King James-only person, I apologize for stepping on your toes. I love the King James. It is, that's where I apply my memorization I'm with you, I love it, but this is a variance. 
what I will say this, and again, I'm, I'm on healing. Jesus rewards those who diligently seek him. God rewards. It says so in Hebrews 11, verse 6. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That phrase, diligently seek him, literally means crave him. As we come to him and crave him, we can expect the rewards, one of which is physical healing. The context of Isaiah 58, verse 6, however, is restoration and wholeness of God's covenanted people. I'm not a replacement theologian. I, I really have some issues when we say the church replaces Israel, and maybe you disagree with me. I'll just refer you to Romans 11, and at least we can agree to disagree. It's not the crux of what I'm trying to say. What God wants us to know is that his church is a big deal. Isaiah 58, when it talks about the healing coming quickly, is talking about a nation that is wounded. Ever since the first century, the inception of the church, there's been a lot of wounds in this church, in, in his body. Very soon after, there was fractures, there was denominations, there was divisions. Look at 1 Corinthians, the epistle that Paul wrote. Lots of divisions. Lots of divisions. This church is called to be a hospital. And we are part of a greater church. The church of Jesus Christ across this region, across the world, really. But the specific focal point that he's given us is this region. Paul says this, God has put all things under Jesus, Ephesians 1, verse 22, and given all things to him, made him head over the church. And then in verse 23 it says, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Let me paraphrase. When our churches are united in the loving counsel of God, when we love each other and love him, when there's no petty divisions over whether you're a replacement theologian or not, <laughs> when there's no petty differences about whether we sprinkle our children in baptism or don't, when we get past those things and we really get to the essence, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus setting us free from the law of sin and death, great things happen. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It is a big deal, and it's spelled out in Scripture. He intends his church to be the full expression of who he is. Hallelujah. If you can, say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we choose to seek you first in all things. We welcome your healing will to be done on earth, in our region, through your church, and through us, just as it is in heaven. Holy Spirit, we welcome your resurrection life to flow into our bodies, souls, and spirits, restore, renew, and regenerate everything within us that needs healing. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we get ready to take communion. And I'm going to quickly give you what I gave the church last night. A few quick tips on your fasting. If you're not fasting this time, then don't worry about it. When you fast, Jesus says, do it when he tells you. And these are some tips for you. Use spirit-led discretion. Some people, a 21-day fast is just impossible, if not harmful in some ways. It can be. Maybe you're just doing one day a week. Maybe you're not doing anything at all. Maybe you're just fasting coffee. Maybe you're fasting all food. Use discretion. It's about relationship, not ritual. I want to encourage you to stay hydrated. This is practical things, guys. Stay hydrated. Your breath smells if you don't. <laughs> At least mine does. No, but you... Yeah, that's true, but... <laughs> You might, you might feel a little lightheaded when you get up in the morning. Your blood volume is going down. Keep the fluid up. Don't let just a little 
lightheadedness deter you? Again, use discretion, but stay hydrated. Amp down, number three. Amp down and hang in there. Some of you are working, like, because you have to in this fast. Do what the Lord leads you to do. You're, you're going to receive the blessing. Those, those of us that aren't, able, aren't working as physically, aren't exerting as much, you're going to receive the blessing either way. Follow the Lord. It, be, at, be at peace to just do what God's told you to do. That said, some of you, God has spoken. I want you to fast this, and it's really hard. You're like that kid that's in the high chair, and there's no food in your mouth. It's, it's not fun. I want to encourage you to hang in there. Meditate on the word and pray the word. I was so encouraged to hear that the pressed but not shaken group yesterday, the women's group, were talking about this subject. They didn't even know that this was something I was going to encourage the house with. But pray the word. And the word of God also says, if you want to pray the word, the word of God also says, he knows every word on my mouth before I speak it. Sometimes prayer is just listening. The old adage, he gave us two ears and a mouth for a reason. <laughs> I want to encourage you, he's going to speak to you and he's going to reveal things to you. I want to encourage you to journal. This is an example of a journal entry that I wrote and then we'll go right into communication, communion, communication with the Father. This is, a, this is an, a note that I wrote this day last, last, year, last year during the fast and something God gave me and I, I just wanted to bless the house with it. God was just speaking to me. I want you to be my messenger, not my manager. God spoke to me through a dream I barely remember. In the dream, I was deciding how to apply his light instead of being his light. <laughs> do, you see the, do you see the pride? <laughs> God, how do I apply this light? I've called you to be my light. This is relationship. <laughs> Rely on me. Be in the light. I've called you to be my light. Amen. Yes. It involved how to reach the large group at ACF. He impressed on, my, on me the solution to the deciding. Be my messenger to the one right in front of you. Don't try to manage my message to the group of people. Be my message to the individual. Individuals make up every group. This is how I want you to see it. And this is how I want ACF to see it. I, anytime a prophetic word is delivered from anywhere in this house, the word of God tells us, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. This is a house I want to encourage you to test every individual word that you receive from me, from anybody in this house. Every word that you receive corporately, test it. The people that are giving words, the people that are praying, they're fallible. The word of God is not. <clears throat> and Jesus is not. That said, I do believe that's a word from the Lord. Jesus led that by example. He focused on the one right in front of him all the time just took me a little while to see it, and I'm still getting it. Father, we thank you for giving Jesus who broke his body for us. We thank you that your body was broken, Jesus, and we commune right now with each other, just as you said we should, and we commune with you with reverence and inviting the revelation of what you did for us by giving your body for us on the cross. Let's partake. Fruit of the vine. Jesus says, it's the new covenant of my blood. Jesus, we thank you for the new covenant. We remember again and again and again May the remembrance of you spilling your blood for us increase, increase, increase in our hearts and all the ways that you want to minister to us as we partake in remembrance of your blood spilled for us. We welcome you to minister to our hearts right now. In Jesus' name. <clears throat>